All right, what's going on, everyone? I'm Preston Stewart with Sayer Payne from War Stories, and today we're joined by Maria Godovich. Did I get it, Maria? You got it. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I feel so bad about pronunciations. Good job. Yeah, that was, um, we spent a fair amount of time getting that sorted out ahead of time. But, anyways, <laughs> Maria is an author and wrote a book that I came across by chance a few months ago called Top Dog about a working dog. I'm actually interested to hear the, the right terminology because I feel like I've thrown a lot out, but a working dog named Luca. So Maria, thank you very much for taking the time today. Yeah, thank you for having me here. It was actually really fun how you found, how you reached out to me. Um, and somehow it was through TikTok. Yeah, or, the power of the internet, yeah. Yeah, you get you got me hooked on TikTok. It's actually your fault. Uh -oh. uh, <laughs> but um, I really I really have enjoyed following you there and uh, other places since then. So I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Yeah, so there were... A handful of requests at one point a few months ago of people saying, can you do a story about Luca, Luca, Luca? And I, I had not heard Luca's story, didn't, didn't recognize the name, um, looked it up. It is really incredible. And it's, it's cool because we have so many stories about soldiers and Marines and airmen. We don't have a lot of stories about uh, war dogs, working animals um, in these conflicts for whatever reason. But um, so anyways, did a little video on that people started writing all sorts of great comments, like it needs to be a movie. And next thing I know, there's Maria writing in the comments. Uh, I wrote this book. We've been trying to make it a movie or whatever. You responded to a ton of people. It was really cool. Um, but anyways, then you sent me a book. So um, thank you, Maria. Gave it a nice read. It, it's awesome. And say, if you haven't checked it out, man, 100% worth it. Thank you. No, I would like to. It's, um, we were, the dog story is an interesting one because you know, we work with them directly. So and I'm sure we'll get into it, but um, it's always, I didn't know about working with dogs until the military and then forging that relationship. And, you know, we worked with a Marine dog that was like that, the, the ones where you could do off leash. And um, so it was real um, interesting. So what, what got you, because I mean, I'm personally involved. It's easy to get into in, interested in something that you, I have direct experience with um, that kind of falls into your lap. How did this sort of fall? How did you come to this book and just the idea or even learn about it? Because not a lot of people know about military working dogs in general that aren't tied to it. Right. No, it's great. I actually really like to hear about your experience as well. This stuff is so fascinating to me. But um, I was a I'm a journalist. I've been a reporter all my life. And um, at that time, I was just doing some freelance editing. And I had done some guidebooks on places to take dogs. But I was doing some freelance editing for a, a big dog website. And um, I, had, um, I had been writing some articles about dogs in the military. And this was uh, in, let me see, around... 2010, 20, 2009, 2010, 2011. And I had been thinking this really deserves to be a topic, a, a book in and of itself. My dad was a very young soldier in World War II. And he would tell my brother and me when we were growing up about, um, about his adventures. Over, uh, he, he, was, uh, he had a hard time over, uh, overseas. And he said that it was actually the military dog that was with them that helped them by day. He said he saved people by day and he saved souls at night. And my dad was homesick. I mean, it was, he was 18 and um, the dog would always come up to him and they'd just, you know, hang around. And, and I grew up with this mythology of the working dog, the military dog and how, how heroic they are. And so that was in the back of my mind as well. And, and then in um, 2011, the Bin Laden raid happened and the world found out that there are military dogs. Most people oh, yeah. had no idea until that mm -hmm. time. And so Navy SEAL Team 6 brought along their dog. Um, and the, no one knew what the dog did. Or it was, it was a long time before anyone found out more about that dog. And so what happened then was I thought, this is a good time to, to, to maybe propose a book like this. And by coincidence... Uh, a literary agent got in touch with me because of my background and I don't know what else uh, she saw me online and she said would you be interested in doing this book and I said I'm just about to start uh, start something on that and um, and we got a proposal I got a proposal together and um, and that that uh, came like I guess uh, about I had a very very short time I, I got a really good publisher and I had a very short time to pull together my book 
um, soldier dogs, which is back there. That was my first one. And, um, and that was, that was, a that was an incredible experience. I learned so much and I had to do so much in a, a very short time. I didn't, I could have gone over to Afghanistan. I actually didn't want to, uh, I didn't have time. I had four and a half months to put this book together. And also mm. I knew it would be problematic for a journalist to go along uh, with the troops who were doing this. Uh, I didn't want to be the baggage. And so, um, so I stayed here, but I did travel around the U.S. and saw a lot of pre-deployment training and got to know what uh, the inside scoop. Then um, that book did really well. I was, I got some very good publicity for it. And um, in, in doing that book, I, I talked to Chris Willingham. I was, I was finding out about the dog who, who led the book. Uh, I, I have a dog story in the beginning, everything weaves throughout soldier dogs. And so um, I'm talking about a Marine and his dog throughout the book and what happens to them. And one of the people I had to talk to, or I talked to was Chris Willingham, who was the, I don't know, was he gunny sergeant or he was staff sergeant at the time? Can't remember, gunnery sergeant. Um, and he was with uh, this Marine. And it turns out that I didn't know it at the time, but he was Luca's, he had been Luca's handler. Um, and then when word got out later that uh, he and Luca had reunited and we'll go into that, um, I reached out and I said, are you interested at all in, in doing something together? And that's how Top Dog came about. So it was really uh, just a, a long path, but I'm, I, it's my, I just love the whole experience and, and Luca is incredible. It seems like this is a topic where people that were involved in it with working dogs in general really want to share those stories. I imagine it wasn't hard to get people to talk about Luca or their experiences with other dogs. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it was really most, it, Luca was the focus, of course, of top dog, but in soldier dogs, I, I was a little, uh, I was a little hesitant because I thought, who, it's, is it a secret? What do they, does anyone want to talk about what they did with their dogs? Yes, everyone wants to talk about their dogs because everyone's dog is their best friend. Like every, every dog is the best dog. Like, you know, this guy's dog, this guy's dog, they, their dog is the best dog because their dog is to them and to the people they served with and they're dying to tell the story and there aren't enough venues for this kind of thing. So people were really happy to share their stories and uh, that, that was great. And I'm really happy to be able to provide a venue for these stories as well. So four and, a, four and a half months seems like a, I've never written a single book, but four and a half months seems. It was crazy. It was crap. not good. I would never, ever, ever, ever do that again. <laughs> I didn't sleep. I worked 21 hour days. Um, it was, it was nonstop. And um, I, 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 it worked out well and the book did well, but it's, uh, it was grueling. And I didn't, at times, I just didn't know if it was going to happen. And it really depended even to the last minute of uh, getting in touch with a couple of people about uh, the main, the main Marine in the book. Um, but it all, it all worked out. And um, I got, I guess I caught up on my sleep later. <laughs> well, let's, let's do, uh, I, this is going to be asking a lot when you wrote an entire book about Luca, but can we do a short summary of Luca, a little bit of a teaser for the book, maybe? Oh, absolutely. We can do more than that. Um, <laughs> I, I love talking about her. Um, so Luca was a specialized search dog, SSD, they call them. And that was a new job in the military. There are, um, in the Marines and the army, they were starting to use these dogs off leash. So what they do, okay, they're sniffing out explosives. And as y'all know, IEDs, uh, were very problematic in the areas where they were at that time it was Iraq and um, that was it was a huge deal and it turns out that dogs are the best weapon against IEDs they are they are detecting them far better than any machinery anything out there any technology even now all these years later and so dogs would um, walk point they would go ahead of, of people or wherever they were meant to be through uh, these uh, areas where there could be IEDs, whether in farm fields or in villages and in, in houses where they'd have to go through looking for weapons. Um, so they would sniff out explosives of, of any kind from weapons to, uh, to bombs. And they, they're really, really good at it. And so the best thing though for a, a dog is to be able to go uh, to follow her or his nose, right? Instead of the handler on leash leading where the handler thinks maybe there's something, mm -hmm. give the dog 
the ability to follow their nose. And the way to do that is, I mean, you can have a long leash, but that gets uh, a little dicey sometimes, depending on what's going on, um, is off leash. And so Luca is one of the very first dogs who was trained to be this off leash kind of dog. And this training happened in Israel with IDF. And so they were doing this, they were leading the way at the time. And so US sent over a few choice people. And one of them was Chris Willingham, who would become her handler. And, um, and I wrote about another close friend of his and the dog he got. So they were, they went to Israel, they were, um, they got to work with the dogs a little bit. And Chris really wanted to get Luca. And, um, and this other guy um, I wrote about in the book ended up not with he he liked Luca a lot too. He ended up with a problem child. He ended up with a dog named Bram and I or Bram and I wrote about that. <laughs> There's some pretty funny adventures they have. But Chris and Luca bonded right away, straight away. She looked at him and like he's like, "You're it. You're the one." And um, and it would be a career filled with um, with so much uh, so much richness and the the bond they had ended up saving so many people you can't really count the number of people that yeah. you say right you know you you detect mm -hmm. a, an id you don't know how many how many people including locals that that mm -hmm. you say right and so um they they trained there and uh, they did great so what happens with these sort of specialized search dogs is they are able to uh, read hand signals also uh, they would sometimes wear radio in their pack uh, or on their harness and mm -hmm. the handler could quietly say left right forward stop stay and they would do that yeah I, I got to see her do that in, in, in dc um it's it's phenomenal and she was so good at it and and she was one of those dogs who so she um i'll give you I'm, i know this is not a brief synopsis but um <laughs> as you can tell i love talking about her um she went on three combat missions in her career the first two to iraq the last one to afghanistan she led uh more than I mean, sorry, three combat deployments, sure, actually yeah. more than uh, 400 missions, and no one was ever hurt while she was on watch. And there was a lot that they could have been hurt by. This wasn't just, you know, a walk in the park, right, at that time. And so um, she detected so many IEDs and, and found so many, uh, so many weapons and uh, was, it, she wasn't, these dogs are not trained to uh, do protection but I think she would have uh, she would have had their back for that as well, and the, the the training is is nonstop even when they're there in you know in the heat of summer or whatever, uh, as as you know, Sarah, uh, they're they're just always working or training, and they do it. And ironically, I think that um, for a war dog like Luca, they're the times when they are uh, on deployment may be the best times for them because stateside or wherever they're based they are uh they are in their kennels they spend the night in the kennel and when they're on deployment they're pretty much with their handlers 24 7 unless there's a big kennel mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. they're there they're eating with the guys uh and the women they're they're doing everything with people and they're doing what they love what they've been trained to do and so luca was one of those dogs who could tell he was having a hard day who is whose girlfriend had just broken up with them from afar or whatever when they're out there. So she would sniff out the bombs and then she would go to the person who seemed to most need it and, uh, you know, have her little uh, water bottle. She'd love to chew on a water bottle and play with the water mm -hmm. bottle. That seemed to make everyone feel better, including her. So she, and, and they work for, they, they work for um, a, a, a toss of a Kong. You know, Kong is one of those like rubber ball things, uh, mm -hmm. no man. or, and the, the handler praise. They want to please their handler. They love their handler so much. I know that's anthropomorphizing, but they do. And, uh, and the handler feels that same bond. Without that bond, none of this would happen. They wouldn't, they wouldn't be out there. The handler, could, the handler has to be able to read the dog. They have to know what that dog is doing. Like Luca, when she would alert, what her alert was and when she was just kind of looking around and you know and thinking about something else or whatever he had to know exactly what luca was doing and she had to be able to read him as well um and so that's that's how these dogs work and luca to me was the epitome of a military working dog she she was a marine through and through her her official name is luca k458 and um every military dog has a, a number after their 
uh, name and it was branded into her ear as they all are. Um, and she, mm. she was just, uh, she was phenomenal. And uh, I, I won't, I don't know if you want to get into what happened to her. Uh, yeah, this. we'll get, I think we'll get there. Okay. Um, I was going to say, we, Sayer and I were in Afghanistan in uh, Kandahar in 2010 and 11, which is just a li- the, the next province east from where Luca was, was wounded. Um, and there's IEDs everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. And we, our first big operation, I don't know if you remember this piece of it, Sayer, but we had a Marine with a dog for the first time. And I remember the way that it was presented was this dog was trained in Israel and all of us thought, I don't know anything about dogs, but that sounds, that sounds <laughs> impressive. Um, but it got to the point in our area, again, Sarah, correct me if I'm remembering this wrong, where the only thing that had to happen on every dismount of patrol is you had to have a dog. Wow. Was that, That's was mm-hmm. that right, Sarah? They were, they, yeah, that so- was the one piece of, that was the one counter IED measure that was trusted more than anything else. When um, we first came in, it was an area where special forces were, or operations were operating, and they had all these assets, like just all sorts of technology and things that were in a regular army you don't really have. And I just, I remember them first talking about their, you know, that we don't go without a dog. And I'm like, must be nice to be you guys, <laughs> because we don't have any of that stuff. And, um, it did. It, it is funny, though, because we evolved into that, though. That is what it became. And our first real mission, like it's called Operation Dragon Strike. It was the big sort of crossing into no man's land, the big battles and stuff, pushing into the Taliban country. That's when we were assigned the Marine working dogs from. That was, they took commands in Hebrew and that dog was assigned to my platoon. So I operated it with it, it for this uh, sort of tip of the spear sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And um, it was, uh, yeah, Preston, you were smiling about the walkie-talkie. It had, the dog had the walkie-talkie on the back, too, um, with the, on, the, on its vest. And I don't remember if it was a male or female dog, um, but the dog was, all, it was a Belgian Malinois. Malinois? That's another one I don't know how to Malinois, say. yeah. I don't, yeah, I'm pretty sure it wasn't a German Shepherd. I think because that was the first introduction to that dog breed. I never heard of it before. And um, the dog was amazing. He, um, he did find an IED. He, um, I'm just going to say he, uh, he could, he did the, in the field, he could zigzag like, uh, just like 200 yards or whatever, really as far as that remote, the walkie talkie will go where they can just do this serpentine and sort of scour a whole area, like a whole, uh, rectangle sort of out in front of you. And, not that we like blindly assume that it's clear because we are also using, we're, we're carrying uh, metal detectors and we're carrying metal detectors slash ground penetrating radar equipment too. So we have those sort of technological aspects, um, things at our disposal. But my experience, that was like September, you know, and we did this all the way until pretty, the very end of May with the dogs. Um, and then the various iterations of our technology. And yeah, my, my take is the dog. Well, first going, the best thing is using your brain and, and experience and not going where you probably shouldn't walk, right. um, understanding that. But then there are certain areas where you have to go and you know that this break, this crossing, this building structure is bad, but I have to still do it. Dang it. I'd rather go around. We'd rather just avoid it in general. But the times when you have to do it, it's the dog first. And then because the thing with the gadgets are, they're always beeping. They're beeping all the time. So there's boy who cried wolf going on. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and you're walking kind of fast and you just, and then it just becomes, you're almost just going through the motions, it feels like. But the dogs, when they hit, they hit and they would find things. And it was, and it's really awesome because it's like a living creature that you're working with. And it's like this teamwork thing. Cause that's what the military is. It's all, everybody has, every job is important. Um, and they all have to work together. And it, for us, it was a very key. Um, I, I use the term asset. Cause that's what you're doing when you're out there. You're deploying assets, you're deploying machine guns, you're utilizing helicopters and military working dog. They're all in sort of this combined action thing that we were doing at that time, 2010. 
that is really a great story. You don't remember the dog's name, do you? I have it, I'm sure, in a journal that I have. Yeah, that would and... love to know because there are very few dogs at that time who were trained. And oh, Luca really? was on that same, in that same uh, exact time where you were there with Dragon Spear and everything. So um, that that's, and there were, and she knew, we, I know of a few other dogs who were that. So at some point, you know, I'd love to hear that's a, and you said it so beautifully. It was like you, and you had that experience of working with them and seeing what they can do. And I don't know if that Malinois was, Luca is a half Malinois and half shepherd. So as you can, I don't know for your, not I, was, or yeah. I saw the slash when I was reading about the book too. And I was, that was a question I had, like what breed was Luca specifically? Yeah. Yeah. So she was, she was half and half, which is a really, um, they were doing that and they still do that. It's actually very good if you get the right blend. So what they're looking for is the steadfastness and, um, kind of calming, uh, more calm nature of a, of a shepherd with the, uh, the, uh, the ability to just keep going like Malinois. Malinois are just adrenaline. They're, they're all adrenaline all the, uh, all the time. I'll, generally speaking, there are exceptions, of course, but they are looking for that combination of calm yet energetic at the right times. And um, they, and Malinois are a little smaller. And so, you know, if you, when you have to lift a shepherd over a fence or a big, you know, wall or something, that's a little more problematic. So um, I don't, I don't think Luca was that much smaller than a shepherd. I think she, I mean, she was definitely, I would say a little more shepherd looking to me than, yeah. um, but, but she had, she had the best of everything. She was smart. She was calm in the face of danger. Uh, she was passionate about her job. I mean, I have to say she loved what she did just as her handler loved what he did. And she, she just led the way, as you said, you know, she was the one leading the way through these really problematic areas and people trusted her. They actually ended up, um, like you guys probably did, they ended up, people um, would end up asking for her by name when they had to do um, yeah. particular types of missions. They, they asked for Luca. And so uh, they tried to accommodate that. But um, as you said, they, they, you have all that machinery, all the technology. And that's interesting. I hadn't heard about the beep, beep, beeping all the time. But um, I'm sure all it's good time. getting better all the time. But they're still finding that the dog's nose is better. My most recent book is about um, dogs who detect illness. And uh, they're so good at it. And, and with diabetes, for instance, they can tell before yeah. you're your uh, glucose monitor that you're having a low like 10 or 15 that's amazing for that yeah so so if you can train them on a scent and they're they're focused and and like like what they're doing they are so good at this and i'm a little concerned that with the drawdown uh with with, the, with whatever is going on now uh there are not going to be as many dogs uh being trained and next time they're needed they'll probably have to start a little more uh, from scratch than they probably should. That's been a concern all along that's happened before, uh, but hopefully they'll keep the, the program fairly rich because it needs to be something that, as you said, these are invaluable assets and they need to continue with this. Well, it's kind of crazy if you think about it, that it's not like we discovered dogs can be a help on the battlefield 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. They've been doing it for, I'm sure you know, but a long, long time. Yeah, officially since World War II, but you know, unofficially way before that. Yeah, in, like, in the U.S., I should say. Yeah. We, there were there's certain technology we have today, counter ID technology that we didn't have 10, 20 years ago. But we've known for 80 years at least that dogs can be a benefit on the battlefield. So it it was almost kind of surprising when they started rolling them out. 2010 was not early in the war, right? That's that's late. So when they're from our perspective rolling dogs out, it's like oh, what a great idea. But when you step back and think about it, it's like too long. Yeah. They were, they were starting to scramble around then dogs were going over earlier than that, but, um, they, they put together these rapid training programs for dogs who, uh, were not official military dogs and for, um, members of the military who were not official dog handlers before that. I mean, a lot goes into that job yeah. and they yeah. were doing these quick turnaround programs that you probably know about. And, um, they weren't, sometimes they worked really well. 
And sometimes they didn't, you know, a dog needs more training and they, they need more time with the handler and the handler needs more training. So they, the word got out, the dogs were really good. And it's like, Hey, let's just get a whole bunch more dogs out there yeah. as quickly as we can. And that didn't always prove um, as beneficial as they had hoped. And it ended pretty sadly sometimes as well, but I, I would like to see the military continue to keep the, the program strong. And I, I don't know if that's going to happen at this point. I hope so. That's how we went from one dog per company to one per platoon in three months. They were, they were grabbing infantrymen who raised their hands and said, I'd like to work with dogs. And like three months later, they'd show up with a dog and it was better than nothing for sure. Yeah. Um, the dogs would hit, but I mean, Sayer was a, Sayer had a lot more experience to that than I did. Yeah. They, um, it's exactly what you described. And, and by the way, it's, I really would like to state, it's not just the dog Luca, it's the handler team. It's the combo because the handler is very important. And what Maria described is the, it's leadership by love versus fear. And that's with anybody and how you can lead. Um, but those relationships of love, there's this symbiosis. And that's what you want to keep vibing on. Your platoon should hopefully have that. You know, you've got the vibe where you know how to work together and what makes each other person tick and get ticked off too, by the way. That's at least, you know, but you have those sort of, uh, because you're living together the whole time and um, you have handlers that trust the judgment of platoon leaders and then others that don't want to like sort of, cause they're not, they're an attachment. They're not one of the guys per se. Mm -hmm. And um, that has its own sort of distinctions. And, you know, we'd run into issues with where they wouldn't want to use the dog. And again, you know, I am describing the dog as an asset. And so it's mine. And um, you need to listen to me. And, and so, uh, but I'm going to take your advice at the same time. If you're going to tell me, so it, there are no perfect answers here. And that's why it, it, it is relationship based and um, the handler deploys the asset. So the asset has to be able to do its job, but the handler also, um, they're the ones who speak English, obviously. <laughs> and so um, they, it's just, a, it's, um, it's an important relationship. And ours started with the Marine dog. And then, and then it's like we had Air Force MPs and Navy MPs that they weren't Army dog handlers. And then, um, and they would come to us for uh, like we, a couple weeks at a time. And they kind of get tossed around the platoons. We have three platoons. And then they would go back to kind of the, the base and then go to maybe to a different company. Or maybe we would try to get the same ones again, like you were mentioning, Luca, uh, because you had someone like the head handler in the head Air Force person in charge of the kennel, if you will, um, picking and choosing where everybody goes. And they're a little politic in there, right? You want to work with people you like, of course, and really good ones at that. Uh, and be selfish. Uh, that's just what it is. But um, in fact, um, we, we were uh, an infantry company, and our uh, KIA that we, the person we had killed in action was a dog handler. It was a it was Sergeant Zaina Creamer, who was actually a woman. This is right now, women can be combat arms in the infantry. But in 2010, they weren't allowed. And she, just like you mentioned, lived with us, ate, slept with us. Uh, we don't have bathrooms. We're going to bathroom in holes. And we're living with the Afghan National Army. And we're doing patrols in the middle of the Wild West out of a fort, essentially. And uh, they struck an IED. And um, she ended up dying from that and her dog survived. And I don't know what happened with the dog, but she was a Navy MP attached to us. And this was in January of 2011. And so I just feel like Preston, I don't want to speak for Preston, but well, we were the Delta dogs for one. And um, we just, I will always have an attachment or an, um, just a, a love for the military working dog and just a very personal relationship. Sarah, I think she was, I think she was army. I was looking it up just now, 212th military police detachment. So I think she might have been. In either the army? Way. I think so, but. Not me. Um, okay. Chris Willingham, who was her initial handler, Luca had two handlers actually. And he would go around now, what you're just saying, Sarah, what, you know, the, the handler has to, they have to brief everybody about what the dog mm -hmm. is capable of. And, and his, his biggest thing, you know, he would talk up the dog, but he would say they're proven, but not perfect because they're not going to detect everything they're they can have a bad day too and there's so much going on and um they're they're not 100 percent even the best of them 
And so um, he would, he would go through that and there, he would start out and this probably happened with you guys sometimes facing like skepticism about the dogs. And, Mm -hmm. um, and then at the end, always with Luca, they, they wanted her back. And she was definitely one of the the ones requested. He ended up being a kennel master, which is one of the people who um, end up, you know, telling, asking people, okay, you, you go there, you go there. This is what we're doing right. um, in, a, in a later deployment in Afghanistan um, without Luca, actually. So he was, he was in that situation. And I know he, he, so he's seen that from both sides. Yeah. My, and that'd uh, be tough having to separate too, when we got to that point. Oh yeah. That is, uh, I don't know if you want to talk about that. Here, Let's like, do that. I, yeah. So I, I get um, a, a a lot of, I don't know the percentage, but a lot of questions about dog handlers and how to become a dog handler in the army. A lot of people really like that idea of doing that in the military. And a lot of the questions that come with that, and I don't generally know the answer to, but I have an idea. Do you get to keep the dog? Do you get to bring the dog home? Do you get to always have that same dog? And I think the answers are probably not what people want to hear. Yeah, they're not what people want to hear. Go ahead, Uh, Maria. But they can have happy endings. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, dogs usually stay with a handler for a couple of years, maybe, and then they go off to someone else. The idea is, you know, whatever, it, because handlers move on. They, they People get bummed up all the time. And a lot of people I know who are handlers wanted to stay at that same level. They didn't want to be promoted because once you're at a certain rank, you're not going to be working with dogs anymore. Um, and in addition, it's just uh, what what is needed and that they if you're supposed to be home at this time and your dog can go off again, then you, you got to send the dog with someone else. And so the dogs um, do, there's an adoption program. And at the end of a dog, when a dog is ready to retire, uh, the handlers will get first dibs, of course. And oh, nice. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so that's how a lot of handlers do end up being able to adopt their dogs. And it's a public program based out of Lackland Air Force Base. And so there's a long, long list of people waiting. They wait like a year and a half or two years for a military dog. And most of those military dogs they adopt are not the ones who deployed. They're the ones who ended up staying here, um, maybe being training aides as they call them at Lackland where all the training is being done, but they're still, they've done their part and they're they're incredibly uh, wonderful dogs. And there's a lot of people who want them, but the, the handlers, uh, there, and then sometimes handlers are vying with each other to get their dog because the dog has been through mm-hmm. the handlers. So it's like, who does take the dog? And in answer to the question about, does the dog go home with the handler? No, yeah. not, not during deployment. The dog goes, goes to the kennel. That's what I was saying earlier that the, the dogs really enjoy um, being able to stay with their handlers 24 seven on deployment, like the kind of deployment you guys went on. Um, where they're, you know, it doesn't matter if you're sleeping in a foxhole or, you know, or whatever in a, in a grubby little cabin or wherever, somewhere, or in a tent or nowhere, they, they're just, they want to be with their, with their person and, uh, and their person wants to be with them. So, um, they've, they're, they go through, they go through so much and, um, I, I hate to see them separated. I, I think the, I don't know, I'm not advising military. So, but I, I would personally like to see them be able to stay with their, uh, together for more than say one deployment or whatever it was at the time or for like for a, a career period. handler kind of thing yeah 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 I mean if that's possible but then the the worry I think is that what if something happens and the the person doesn't want to stay in the military and then the dog is so attached to that person after five years or something then what um then they you know I don't think they're ready to retire a valuable asset like that, just because the handler wants to take the, the dog home. I'm um, I'm in the Coast Guard Auxiliary, which is the volunteer arm of the Coast Guard. Nice. And that's different because those dogs are not DOD, uh, they're Homeland Security. And so they do go home at the end of the day with their handler. And there's one out here, he's a Vishla and a Hungarian Vishla, and he's such a character. And I love, I, I get to go out with him and film him and photograph him for, um, I'm, I'm doing social media for them. and he's a joy. It's really, really fun to watch him. And I'm just, it's so nice to see him be able to go home. And again, he's just a bomb sniffer. He's not out there. Um, I think one of the worries is with military dogs <clears throat> who are dual trained. So for protection and, and detection, um, that that could get out of hand sometimes. And you've got the, the dog who is ready to get the bad guy, shall we say, uh, coming home to the, the person who has two kids. Um, gotcha. And so that, that is a concern. But then again, these dogs, they're tested at the end of their career. And if they're deemed okay enough to go to a regular household, 
they do that. Sometimes they have to be very specific about where this dog ends up in the countryside, far away from other people and dogs. They do their best. And in the past, uh, dogs were, they did not have a good time after, after their deployment. They were euthanized oftentimes. And uh, mm-hmm. <clears throat> that has changed. There's something called Robbie's Law that came around. And um, dogs, it's extremely rare for a dog not to be able to, you know, to, to have to be euthanized at the end. It's usually because they're so sick or something. Dogs, dogs can be riddled with cancer and keep on, keep on doing their job. When you would never yeah. ever know. So they do these checks, and it's usually a physical reason. But in the past, um, it wasn't, and it was really really bad. And of course, we know the Vietnam history where dogs were thousands of dogs were just left. Um, and handlers I know from Vietnam are still um, crippled by that. They they keep mm. whatever memento they had from their dog by their bedside. They talk to their dog. They the dog got them through so much, and then we just abandoned those dogs. Uh, fortunately, policies have changed since then, and and I hope you know we keep learning the lessons that we're learning along the way, uh, and things will continue. That's the goal. Yeah, exactly. So Let's for not repeat them. I was yeah. going to say, let's, let's get back to Luca. Cause there's, Sorry, a, yeah, yeah. No, no, excuse me. Great. There's a, there's a dip, there's some sadness, but I, I think we say, I, I would say Luca ends on a positive note, right? Oh, absolutely. It, it's um, there is definitely sadness. And in the book, I mean, it's war, people get killed. Um, um, and there's one, I, I have a personal story in that where um, there's a, a, a young soldier named Corey Weens and he, uh, he had a, a military dog. He had a dog named, um, well, Cooper. And Cooper, he always called Cooper his son. And Cooper and Luca were good friends. Now, um, here you have Marines working with Army, right? And he was a, a, a what they call a mind detection dog. Same thing, but sort of a, a different program than the standard program. But they do the same thing. And so um, Chris was in charge of, uh, he was senior to him, even though they're in different services. And so he would, they would hang out and have fun. And the dogs were so, they kind of joked that they were boyfriend and girlfriend. Um, and they would play with the, this deflated football and they, they had so much fun together. And uh, they were, they ended up uh, in at a place called Patrol Base Murray. And that was, you know, just a remote outpost you were talking about. And um, they, uh, Corey and Cooper went out for what was going to be, you know, what would, they were going to go back to uh, a main base, a safer place right after this. And they went out and they didn't come back. Um, They, they, they encountered an IED and that was it. They, you know, you can't, you can't always get them before they get you. So they both died instantaneously. Um, And it was, it's, it's super hard for Chris to talk about this to this day. Um, And uh, I had, I ended up, um, I wanted to know more and tell his story and his father was okay with talking to me about it, Corey's father. So, um, you know, it was really, it was tough, you know, hearing his story and talking to him and getting that. And he told me, um, when he learned the news, when they came to his double wide in Oregon, uh, knocking on his door, he, he was so mad. He said, I just, I threw a shoe. You know, it's like his memory of, of getting this news. He threw a shoe and, um, Subsequently, he tried to um, appease his grief by um, taking in dogs. Labor- this was a Labrador retriever, yeah. actually. So he took in a yellow lab and another yellow lab, and it just made him feel like he had part of his son with him. And uh, he named one of them Cooper. And, um, and one of the labs was not spayed, and he decided to have a, a litter of Corey Weens and Cooper memorial puppies. And he <laughs> asked me, if I would like one. And my lab had just died the year before and I was so honored. And so sleeping five feet away from me is a Corey wing. I don't know. Let's see. Wait. Yeah, let's see it. Okay, no, like, okay, this is a messy place. Wait, wait, hang on. Oh no. Um, oh yes. man. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> he's a he's a Corey Weens and Cooper Memorial dog. And I tell his story when people ask, you know, where I got him. So that's people, awesome. You know, people still are like, oh, there are dogs in the military. And so I get to kind of continue um, his story. And I, of course, I tell it in the book. And Chris Willingham got one. And so uh, his dog is named Murray after patrol base Murray. And um, so he tells, so I'm, I'm related to Chris Willingham by dogs. We're in-laws now uh, by dogs. Oh, love it. <laughs> or somehow related. Um, 
but that that was a that was a really hard time and um and then after that deployment um chris deployed again with luca in iraq and uh, it was of course a difficult deployment but nothing like the first one and then um then he came back and he was he was moving up in the in the world of military dogs so he was kennel master uh he was i believe he was at pendleton at this time and uh he 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 knew luca had to go out and he had um yeah actually he was he was a kennel master and he went to afghanistan first so he had to leave luca behind he was in afghanistan he saw this marine he really liked juan rodriguez um rod uh, and um everyone uh, and he's like i want this this is the this is the kid i want to be lucas next handler when he realized that he she had to go out again so he uh, you know transitioning luca he was able to transition luca which was really good but it was still really hard like he would he would be like a helicopter dad um he would watch them training and and he would be hiding behind something while they were training together um and luca it took her a while of course and uh, but he had to really stay away from luca and he wanted Rod to bond with her and, and have the best chance. And, and they did. And they went over to Afghanistan for Luca's third uh, combat deployment. And, um, and it, was, uh, it was a tough time over there. And she kept doing the work. This time they were embedded with some green berets for the most part. And they, uh, and they, were, um, they were really doing a phenomenal job she was of course finding the things she always found and everybody loved her and um and then uh yeah so it's a happy ending book uh even you know there's there's there is death throughout but she um i'm giving away the end of my book but uh she you don't have to the, do that we don't have to do that okay well let's just say that she didn't and she went in with four legs and came back with three um but mm -hmm. she the it was so dramatic and they treated her uh, like I won't, I won't talk about exactly what happened, um, but um, in case someone wants to read it, but she, she, um, she did uh, land. She had detected one IED, and then she uh, kind of spun around and was uh, kind of probably just about to alert to another one, and it got her. It was not a huge one, but enough to do you know great damage to her leg. And they basically met a factor out. They, they, they treated her just like, you know, she's uh, a, a Marine she's a Marine. Yeah. Um, and they um, ended up, she ended up in Kandahar. She ended up in a human hospital getting surgery, well, you know, veterinary and surgeon and human surgeons cared for her. And she, and Rod did not leave her side. He slept in the kennel with her. I have this killer picture. Uh, I'm going to send you, uh, he slept in the kennel with her. He didn't, he didn't leave her side only to go to the bathroom. And he was, he was there in surgery. They couldn't save her leg. Uh, so I, you know, I, I talked to the, the veterinarians who did the surgery. I, I got all the details and three days after surgery, after losing her leg, she's, she's out there starting to walk again. She wanted to walk. She just kept, she kept going. She is Luca. She's unstoppable. And she just still had that zest for life. And, and within 10 days, she was like, yeah, I got this, you know, her, her handler rod would, and a vet would hold her up with, you know, a towel at first around her tummy or whatever to help guide her. But she, uh, she kept going and she's invincible. And she, um, she ended up, um, of course, going home. Um, and she, she was reunited with Chris Willingham of all places in all places in uh, Finland because he was doing duty mm. there. He was uh, the only time in his whole career in uh, the Marines that he was not working with dogs. It was a brief time in in Helsinki, and um, he and and they had an agreement before Rod got Luca that if when when Luca retires that he would go to Chris. She would go to Chris Willingham because. You know, he had a more stable life. He had a family, and a, you know, and, and Rod was a single guy, and he he was in he you know he didn't know where he was going. So they were totally fine with that. So Rod actually brought him, her uh, to to Finland, and this was televised because uh, there was some publicity around it, and uh, their reunion was televised, and it was amazing. And Rod stayed with them. She had two dads. She had two dads for the rest of her life, basically. Uh, she stayed. Uh, he stayed with them for a couple of weeks in Finland, and then. Uh, came back. And then when everyone came back stateside, um, the, Luca was, of course, living with the Willingham family, but uh, Rod would come down and visit and hang out. And whenever she visited, he visited, uh, she would stay in his room. Uh, so it was really, really great. And actually right up to the end, um, and she was, she was, a she was also a liaison. She would go to um, Walter Reed and go to the amputee 
area and oh, wow. help people. Yeah, she would inspire people. She was, uh, I've got pictures of her. Uh, in, That's in awesome. That I really like hearing that. Oh yeah, yeah. no, she was there. And, and they all get it too, because they, you know, they were there. They, they, they understand. Um, oh yeah. The she would help them. and stuff. It's such a, it's a, it's a common thing, you know, in those regions. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, that, and, and to see, I mean, yeah, she had four legs, so it's easier to get around with just missing one, but to see what she can do and to see her spirit, it helps so many people. I talked to people that, you know, she really inspired and she, she just continued to inspire people and she still inspires me. Um, she, she is no longer with us. She passed in 2018. She got this sort of sudden um, illness and, um, and Rod and Chris were with her at the end. He came down um, and stayed with the family for a couple of days and they, they took Luke out. Um, uh, you know, she, she was having a hard time with balance and walking at that point, but they, on her last day, they went and got her ice cream and they went for a walk on the beach and, and they took her in. Um, and Jill, his wife and I were uh, having a text sort of uh, vigil. Uh, we, you know, had a whole, I had a whole altar for, uh, Luca, you know, I had just let me a table full filled with her stuff and, and um, she was keeping me apprised and it was a really, it was really tough for them. And even just for me as her biographer or whatever, but um, you know, they, they let her go. They, they let her go when she needed to go. And, but she lives on, she lives on in so many ways. And she, her story still continues to inspire people, including me. Like I get, I, I'm, I'm, in, I was just telling Preston the other day that um, I'm, I'm kind of scared of heights and I'm trying to get over that. And I did this ropes course and I was way up and I was like, oh, I know. And I had a picture of Luca tucked into my you know, clothes mm. and, um, and I started getting scared and sort of like doing a little shaky when I was way up there. And I was like, no, what would Luca do? I've got this. I've got this. And Chris Willing had as well. And so then I got my badass version on and that, and, um, and it was all okay. And she like that, you know, continue in the face of everything with a good attitude and, and with that, you know, that winning, I've got this attitude and, and she didn't let anything get in her way. And I, I love, you know, I love that story. And as you were talking about the movie in the beginning, it needs to be a movie. This is such, a, her story is so, so phenomenal. And um, there, it's just something that uh, it, we did have uh, an agent at one point who was trying to sell this as a family movie no, it's a war movie. This is a war movie. It just happens right. to have a dog yeah. in it. So that's, that's where it needs to be. But uh, I just love, you know, being able to let people know about her and um, she and her, her handler, um, well, her original handler, Chris, Chris Willingham is now uh, president of U.S. War Dogs Association, oh. which is a great organization that does so much. They send care packages over. They do a lot of help for military dogs in general. And they uh, that they he was greatly helped. He and his teams were greatly helped when they were um, over on deployments by this organization. It's been going on for a long time, and I, I actually sent care packages through them um, as well at the time. And they do so much good, and I love seeing that he is now president of this. Uh, but yeah, and and Luca holds a great place. I I I got to know her pretty well. I lived with the Willinghams for a while um and uh in on the east coast when they were back there and she was retired and she would come in i had the i they gave me a basement room and she would i slept on an air mattress and um she would she would come into my room every day when i was there i was like oh luca loves me this is so great she knows i'm her biographer and we have a bond and yeah dogs love me in general but then I ran out of salmon treats. I had, I kept a bag of salmon treats <laughs> and then suddenly Luca wasn't showing up and I realized, Oh, it's the salmon treats. Very so, transactional. <laughs> so, I mean, I know she liked me, but she liked the salmon treats better. <laughs> so, uh, every time I saw her after that, she ended up in California with them and that's where I am. So I would visit them down there and always bring salmon treats. There you go. I, I don't want to downplay the importance of the bomb sniffing and finding IEDs, because you said there's no way to know how many lives Lucas saved. But if we take the smallest number five, it's certainly more than that. Yeah. Think of the generational impact. There's kids born today that whose, whose parents, mom or dad survived because Luca found a bomb would maybe would have killed him otherwise. There's not a lot of dogs that can, there's not a lot of animals you can say that about. I love my dog Colt. Um, he's not going to have a generational impact on families around the country. Um, but I think something you hit on a couple of times, Maria, is the emotional impact these dogs have in a war zone. Um, our handler slept at one point. I remember walking in, in the middle of Afghanistan summer, sleeping in his cot with a, with a 
German shepherd. <laughs> like all of us are stripping clothes off to cool down. And he's sleeping in this tiny cot with the dog and just how much having dogs around helped people stabilize and feel better and smile and give them a, a glimpse of home. There's value there, even if they're not finding bombs. It's, it's, it's a lot. Absolutely. A lot. I, you said it. Um, and, and they, they bring, I mean, I, I wasn't there, but you guys, you guys know, they bring a little bit of normalcy, a little bit of home to uh, like a really bad place. And that is invaluable. That alone, they like, like that goes back to what my dad experienced, right? And and that that moral boost, that morale boost, can get you going, you know, in, in maybe a way you wouldn't have before. So, there are dogs who um, are are there for um, emotion, emotional. I can't remember the name of them, but they had about five dogs who were going around to different places in Afghanistan. Oh. Um, to, to help people just to feel better. And, uh, that, I, obviously that, that was a short lived program since it was, uh, just a few years before we pulled out, but that was, that alone was helpful. But I think, as you said, working with one, you know, seeing your guy sleeping in the same cot in the heat of the night and seeing that it's just, there's, there's nothing. And also, you know, you guys probably saw, uh, I don't, I don't know, you know, how, like there were, there were local dogs sometimes, and I know you're not supposed to take them in or do anything like that, but you know, you can't help it sometimes. And that's a piece of home. And some of these guys ended up and women ended up being able to bring them home through various circuits after the fact. So the dogs are really, really important. And this is like Gus here is not going to do generational impact either, but <laughs> Preston is, is great. And that's so true. Even if it was just five people, you know, imagine the, uh, what that changed. And it was a lot more for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the um it's like the end when you're talking about the morale boost i do remember when we really started when we took over the fort is when they started living with us as more longer attachments well i mean that already was sleeping with us in foxholes but we started kind of getting a rhythm and a place to sleep in the same place to sleep in and just like playing like tug of war with a dog was it did bring you back home and it because you're in like you're definitely in a foreign land. I mean, it's like kind of like being on Mars. It's not what, it's nothing like home. And um, to have that sort of uh, just normalcy, what feels like normal, because you just, you do get so used to getting, you get very accustomed to having normalizing very abnormal situations. And, um, it was just very refreshing to have just a little tug of war with a Kong ball or just to play fetch with a dog. Yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah. That's too cool. Well, Maria, we're coming up on an hour here. I just want to say thank you so much for talking about Luca and, and all of your experiences is we talked about one book mostly, but you got quite a few out there. Where should people go to oh, find out more you. about you or your writing? You. It was really, it was really great talking with you and, and hearing, you know, your experiences too. Um, um, yeah, there, there, well, I don't know how many bookstores still have some of these, but, um, they're available on Amazon, of course, and they're all published by, um, Penguin Random House, a small, uh, uh, an imprint called Dutton. Um, and so, at, or my website is my name, dot guys, Maria Godavage, good luck spelling that, dot com. <laughs> Maybe it'll be on, on we'll somewhere. We'll put in the notes. Yeah. Yeah. So there, I have links, um, through all of those. So, um, so thank you guys. It was really, really good talking with you. And Absolutely. Glad to talk about Luther. Yeah. Thanks, Maria. Yeah. Likewise, it was real nice. Great conversation. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Well, thanks again, and hope to talk soon.